tonight, I want to share something very, very special with you because it, it might be a, a chance really that would never come to me again to be able to share this uh, in, under exactly these circumstances. So Luke chapter 5. And it came to pass as the people pressed upon Jesus to hear the word of God. Jesus stood by the lake of Gennesaret. That's another name for the Sea of Galilee, of course. And saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And Jesus entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's. Of course, that's Simon Peter. And prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And Jesus sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now, when he had left off speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. Let me pray one more time. Lord, we open our hearts and minds to you as fully as we know how to. We ask that you will come speak to us. Brush aside our carefully constructed mechanisms of self-defense and deal with us by the power of the Holy Spirit. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray, the strong Son of God. Amen. As a lifetime missionary, if you will, I've certainly pastored small churches in the United States. I've pastored a mega church. I have been the president of two different universities. But my, my heart of hearts always has been global evangelism missions. We, at Global Servants, we have, and you're, you've been very generous. The, these Wednesday nights, your offering goes to missions, and part of that has been Global Servants. And um, I don't take anything for, for preaching here. They, your church makes a wonderful contribution to Global Servants. What is it? We have two girls' homes. My wife and I began the one in in Thailand in 1987. We have more than 100 girls there. It's a wonderful girls' home to keep girls, uh, tribal girls from the hills of northern Thailand from being sold into child prostitution, which is a, a, a billion-dollar industry in Thailand. We have a girls' home in West Africa. We have all these churches, which I mentioned, that are under the authority of Daniel Odano. We have uh, the NICL that we do here in the United States, which we also, uh, the one here in Atlanta in this area is also at this church. All of these things, the wonderful, wonderful ministries. But where did it come from? I mean, uh, people, uh, I, th I think it's one of the challenges when I speak to young people. They look at a successful pastor like Joey Grizzle, and they think that he sprang full grown from the forehead of Zeus. And... <laughs> They, they lose track of the fact that there's, there's a story behind that. That uh, Joey, perhaps I'm guessing, Joey didn't suddenly just wake up one morning at, at, in his middle 40s and be, and be the pastor of this church. There's mileage behind this, isn't there? There's a story. And, and I think that sometimes by not telling those stories, we steal from our young people the sense of adventure. We've made Christianity too tidy. It's too, it's too safe. Now, I'm, I'm not here to frighten anybody tonight. That's, that's not what I want to do, but I do want to say to you, it's not safe for you to be here. You, you need to hear that. It's not safe. Every time you get out of your car with your Bible under your arm and start into a Pentecostal church, there ought to be a lump in your throat. You ought to say to yourself, anything could happen in there tonight. And, and, you, and you furthermore ought to say, God could say anything to me in there tonight. That's what makes it breathtakingly Exciting, there is a recklessness to, to Pentecostal walking by faith. There, there's a, there is a, a risk element to it. It's not, it's not bad, that doesn't make it bad. In fact, it, it satisfies a deep 
uh, need inside of us that's there by the thumbprint of God. God made us for adventure. And we've bludgeoned that appetite into insensibility by over-securing everything, but, but it's still there. I can prove it to you. Has anybody here ever actually, not seen it on TV, has anybody here ever actually done bungee jumping? Will you raise your hand? Anybody here ever actually done it? N not one. I'm so, pr oh, one. Okay, well, let me just say this to you. My mama didn't raise no fool. Um, <laughs> climb up on a tall tower, let a stranger tie a rope around your ankles and pay him to throw you off. Why, what, what could be the thrill in that? Afterward, you can interview her and ask her, what was she hoping for? It is to watch the ground rushing up at you and praying to God Almighty that they measured that rope right. That, that, there is a, an adrenal rush in that. Scary movies. Why, why do we go to scary movies? Sit in a dark theater with our popcorn and our Coke and say, all right, scare the liver out of me. Why? why? Because there is something inside of us that, that longs for, for the edge. There's something in us that wants to get our toes over the edge of the abyss. Not, not in reckless abandon for no purpose or reason. I'm not talking about being an adrenal jumpy, uh, uh, junkie, uh, jumping out of airplanes without a parachute. I'm talking about being on the cutting edge with God. It is, it is fundamental to the nature of God's call upon our lives is that he summons us to obedience. And obedience always, counting on obedience to always be easy counts on the fact that God never gives us difficult commands. And I just am here to disabuse you of that notion. <laughs> God is a good God. God is a good God, but what is it that I said to you to tell, say to each other just before you sat down? God is good, but he's not safe. I saw four people start for the door and said, I'm out, I'm out of here. <laughs> this is getting scary. In 1975, my wife and I were, I was a Methodist minister, um, completely without uh, any passion, hope, my, my ministry was dead on its feet. I knew there was, I was like a blind dog in a meat house. I knew there was something in there somewhere. I just couldn't get my teeth in it. And, and I was longing, aching. We were, our marriage was in trouble. Our ministry was fruitless and pointless. And we received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the, really, the adventure began. Almost immediately, God began to open doors of ministry beyond that small to medium-sized Methodist church at such an accelerated rate that I, it was breathtaking. The man that prayed with me to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit was Dr. Ralph Wilkerson, God rest his soul, from Melody Land Christian Center in Anaheim. And for some reason, I, I don't know why Dr. Wilkerson just, I guess he saw something in this totally new Methodist preacher and he started inviting me. When I was 29 years old, I was preaching at one of the largest churches in California, occasionally, at his invitation. I suppose, anybody remember Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship? It was a mighty instrument of God in its day. It's over with now, but it was in its day. I spoke at every Full Gospel Businessmen's banquet and luncheon and dinner from Dan to Beersheba. I, I traveled, speaking of those, giving my testimony, traveling, preaching, um, I, I was seeing it happen. It became clear to me that I could not go on pastoring that little Methodist church and traveling. I, the Methodist church was either going <laughs> to... I couldn't be gone all the time and pastor this church, so I had to, I had to make a decision. And I, I went to the Methodist bishop and told him that I wanted to be appointed as the conference evangelist for the North Georgia Conference. He said, do we still have those? I said, well, Bishop, it's in the church discipline. You don't have, what do you call it in the church of God? Not discipline. 
the minutes. I said, it's in the, it's in the minutes of the Methodist church. And he called his secretary and said, bring me, we called it the discipline. He said, bring me a discipline. And I told him where it was. He said, well, it's here. He said, but you understand there's no salary. It's, it's a title. It's just a way that you can keep your, uh, your um, appointment. You can keep your credentials, your ordination, but there's, there's no job. I don't pay you or anything like that. You understand that? And I said, yes, sir, I, but I want to be appointed to that. He said, you understand you're going to go broke, right? And uh, so I insisted, and he did it, and they appointed me. I was the North Georgia Conference Evangelist. I think the first one they had had <laughs> since the turn of the century. And, uh, and, but what nobody told me was that the bishop was a prophet. I didn't know that. Um, so uh, <laughs> we did very nearly go broke. Uh, but it was fun and exciting and adventuresome. We were on the edge every minute of, of poverty and excitement. And, and it, it, was, um, it was one of the most breathtakingly enjoyable seasons of my life up to that moment. My sweet wife, our three little kids, we, we, it was, but it was all in the United States. That was the, the limit of my vision. I just wanted... People look at global servants now and they say, wow, your dreams have come true. I said, no, no, we passed my dreams decades ago. I, all I wanted was I had a burden to travel in, in stone-dead Methodist churches and preach the full gospel message that had become so experiential and real in my life. That's all I wanted to do, and I wanted to find some means and mechanism to do that. That was the limit of my vision travel around in Methodist churches and, and preach the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it was an adventure at a level, at a certain level. One night, I was asleep in the house, my wife, our three little children, little children, and I suddenly awoke. And you ever have that odd feeling somebody's in your house? And I, I woke up and, with that feeling. And I went all through the house, searching. Every door was locked, every window locked. Nobody was in the house. But by that time, I was awake. And uh, I went into the living room and sat down in an easy chair and had an experience. I, I'm not handy with, I, I'm reluctant to use weighted biblical terminology for my own experiences because I don't know what, the people in the Bible meant by those things. So I'm a little bit reluctant to call it a vision. So I don't know precisely what to call it. But in my, I don't mean the ceiling went away and I saw things, but in my mind or in my spirit, I saw a, a map of the world laid open in quadrants. And cities and countries would rise up out of it like they were, they were on a Zoom. And I would see these. And I began to realize that there were places that someday I would preach. And it began to, be, to come to me. You're going to go to this place. Every, every inhabited continent, major cities, countries that I'd never heard of. And, and it was a powerful experience. And then it went away. And this word came into my mind, just the, the, the thought. But first, I want you to go to Ghana. And with that, it was over. I admit to you, in 1981, I was not 100% clear on where Ghana was. So I got down uh, our children's encyclopedias. Before Google, does anybody even remember hardback encyclopedias? Whatever happened to encyclopedias? So I got down the G encyclopedia and laid on my stomach in the rug in the living room and opened up to Ghana, and I began to read about it, and I began to weep, just cry my, my tears falling on the encyclopedia. I thought, my God, I'm having a nervous breakdown. I'm reading about the cocoa product in Ghana and weeping. And uh, that phrase just kept echoing in my mind, go to Ghana, go to Ghana. 
So I went upstairs and woke Allison up and told her about the experience, what had happened. I said, something just happened to me downstairs. I told her about it. She said, what do you think it means? I said, I don't know what it means. She said, what does go to Ghana mean? What does that mean? I said, I don't know what it means. So so, listen to me. (laughs) See, God is not obscure. Go to Ghana. I kept wondering, what what could go to Ghana mean? (laughs) It didn't dawn on me that it actually meant go to Ghana. (laughs) I I was trying to think of some exotic meaning. But it it began to germinate in me. This this happened in um, the early part of the year. And it began to work in me, and, and it became virtually, it's a bad word to use, but obsessive. I began to think about it. Every time the phone would ring, I, I thought it would be somebody from Ghana calling me. You know, it's, I'll get it, I'll get it. You know, and finally, I, I went to hear a man preach. Somebody told me that at a certain church, there was a man from Kenya that was preaching. And so I, I went to hear him preach. I thought, I, I'd never been out of the continental United States. And um, uh, except to, I had made a couple of trips to Mexico, which is really just South Texas. So I, I'd, never, I'd never traveled. I had no interest in it. I just wanted to preach in Meth- Methodist churches, mostly in Georgia. So I went to hear this brother from Kenya thinking maybe it would be something like an, an entree or something. And afterward, I, I went up to him and hinted broadly that he should invite me to Kenya, which he promptly did. He said, please come. And so I, I thought, okay, you know, maybe, maybe God is like horseshoes and close works. You know, maybe in Ghana, Kenya, they're in the same continent. They're about as close together as California and New York. I thought, you know. So uh, I made the plans, got all set. Uh, Two weeks before that trip to Kenya, I began to feel deep distress about making that trip. That I should not go. And I I shared it with Allison and she said, then please don't go. I'm I'm begging you, please don't go. I said, that man's prepared for me, everything. I have to go. She was really clinging to me. Don't do this. Then the week before I was supposed to leave for Nairobi, This man called me from Nairobi and said he had had a blow up in his church of some kind and it wasn't a good time for me to come. And he said, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but you can't come to Kenya right now. And I said, well, you know, whatever. I never told him. Um, I figured into every life a little guilt must come. And so so now now I'm six months into this process. It was very painful. I can't describe it to you. I just... (laughs) I, it was on me all the time. Then I heard about a, a Methodist minister, a college president from Ghana that was at a local church. And I said, this is it. So I went to him. He was the president of a small Methodist college in Kumasi, Ghana. His name was Brew River, Dr. Brew Riverson. I went, met him, and I told him I, I, who I was, and we met and talked and everything, but I didn't hint about him inviting me. I just thought if he does, he invites me, then fine. But he didn't. I got his business card. But he didn't invite me. So I waited and waited. Finally, I'll never forget it. July the 1st, I sent him a letter in Kumasi, Ghana, saying we met at this church. I would love to come to Ghana, but I I need an invitation for my visa. And would you invite me to come to Ghana? And I mailed it July the 1st. July, August, September, October, never heard from him. I never heard back from him. By the 1st of November, I, I, I literally, I thought I'm going to lose my mind if I don't deal with this. So I went to my pastor, my, my Methodist pastor, Spearfield Methodist pastor, my dear friend, and I said, what do you think I ought to do? He said, what did the Lord say to you? I said, he told me, go to Ghana. He said, He said, I I think you ought to go to Ghana. I said, Pastor, what are you talking about? You mean just buy a ticket and go? He said, yeah, 
you know, buy a ticket and go. <laughs> so I was sure my wife would talk me down from this ledge. She didn't want me to disappear into West Africa. So I told her what Lawrence had said. And I said, what do you think I ought to do? She said, Mark, we can't live like this. Buy the ticket. She said, go. So I, I, I went to the travel agency. Anybody remember those? Um, and I told the girl I wanted to buy a round trip ticket to Ghana. She said, oh, I've never sold a ticket to Ghana. She said, you know, um, it's under a military dictatorship, right? And I said, yes, yes, I, I'm fully aware. And she said, do you work for the CIA? I said, I, I do not work for the CIA. Just, I want a ticket, coach class, round trip ticket to Ghana. And I left. No, no access to anybody, no name to call, no phone number, no nothing. And I got to London, and there, when I landed at Gatwick Airport, there was a, a BCAL, the, the airport, this is so long ago, the, air, the, the um, airline I went on doesn't even exist anymore, <laughs> British Caledonian. There was a BCAL representative there with a sign that said, Mark Rutland. I went up, and she said, uh, they've closed the airport, Kodokai Airport. They've closed the airport, and you can't go. I said, great, wonderful. She said, so, you know, just there's another flight leaving back to New York, and you can get on that flight. And I felt the Lord say, I told you to go to Ghana. And I, it seemed unreasonable. So I told her, I said, excuse me. And I, I dashed into the men's room. I know she was thinking, wow, long flight. Um, I went, shut myself in a stall there, and I said, Lord, I'm trying to obey you. I can't, I can't swim. And this thought came in my mind. Ask them how long they have to put you up in London to fulfill the contract they signed you with the ticket. So I went back out and asked her that. She said three days. She said on the third day, if Kodokai Airport opens, we'll fly you on. If it doesn't open, you have to return to the United States on your own dime. So I said, fine. I went to the hotel they gave me. On the third day, my phone rang, and it was that lady. She said, be at the airport in an hour. They've agreed for one flight to come. And I dashed to the airport, got on, and we flew to Lagos. Didn't even get off of the plane. Lagos, Nigeria. Didn't even get off of the plane, and we flew on to Accra. Ghana now is such a wonderful country, prosperous, and, and it's up so much. It's a democratically elected government. It, it's, there's wonderful churches and everything. It's hard now. I, I suspect people that hear me talk about this who weren't alive in 1981 and 82, they don't know what it was like. The head of state had taken the government by the gun. His name was J.J. Rawlings. He called himself Cha Chairman Rawlings because he was a Maoist. He based his title on Chairman Mao. And it was a very dangerous time. They closed the borders. There was no petrol, no uh, gasoline. There was no food in the stores. It was, a, it was a terrible, dangerous, scary time. There was a curfew. Uh, from 10 o'clock, the air raid siren went off. And from 10 o'clock until it went off again at 6 o'clock, if you were in the street, they shot first and asked questions later. They would kill you. The Chairman Rawlings had basically what I would call secret police. They were very scary hombres. So I arrived in Accra Airport, and it was pandemonium. I, ca I can't even describe it to you. I was terrified. People had stolen all the light bulbs. It was dark. People were seething around. There was no order. It wasn't like you lined up, queued up somewhere, and they stamp your passport. There's people pulling on you and seething around. It was, it was craziness. And as far as I could see, and, and it's not some racial thing, it's just a, a reality. I was the only white face I could see in the crowd. I kept looking for somebody that could help me. Finally, a soldier grabbed my arm and said, come with me. He took me into a room, closed the door, and pointed his automatic rifle at me and demanded $400. I was scared to death. I had my hands up and... And I just told him, I said, I'm not giving you $400. I 
I said, I'm an extremely important man in the United States. <laughs> to my wife and three little children, I'm extremely important. And I said, if you shoot me, there's going to be an international incident. I said, the, the United Nations will be here. And I'm leaving. I'm walking out. And I turned and walked out. I, I know you're saying, if, you've, if you'd have been there, you know, if I had faith, I wouldn't be afraid. I was, I was terrified that he was going to shoot me. But I just turned around, I took the door and opened it. I could barely walk. I opened the door and I saw an officer standing there. And I saw the captain's bars. I said, I said, Captain, this soldier's trying to rob me. He's got a gun and he's taking me in this room and he's trying to rob me. He started yelling at him in what I now know is tree, but I did not know then. He was yelling at him. He ordered him out, berated him, and he said, come with me. And he took me back in the same room and drew his sidearm and stole my watch. <laughs> I felt I had traded up. It was a cheap Timex. <laughs> Certainly wasn't worth $400. I thought I had done some creative diplomacy. I got outside and I realized I had no clue what to do. I'm in a strange airport. It's an hour and a half to curfew. I don't know anybody. I don't know where to go. I don't know the name of a hotel. I don't know anything. I, I got in a taxi and the driver said, where do you want to go? I said, okay, see, uh, that's where we've got a problem. And he, he turned around and looked at me and he said, why are you here? I said, okay, see, that's the second part of the problem. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, I said, where do, the, where do the British Caledonian air crews stay when they stay over? He said, oh, they're not British Caledonian. The British government won't let them to spend the night. Get, they get back on the plane. They're leaving. They're not allowed to stay the night. I said, well, are there any foreigners in, in Accra? Where do they see? He said, okay, I'll take you to the hotel where the Germans stay. I said, great. So we went there. I got to the counter. The man behind the counter said, are you an American? I said, yes, here's my passport. You have to think how long ago this was. This is before the Berlin Wall came down. He said, now listen to me. He said, this hotel is full of East Germans. And they hate Americans and they're all drunk. And he said, now, he said, Obroni, it means white man. He said, now listen, Obroni, you go in your room and you stay there. And don't come out until the morning siren says the curfew's lifted. So I, I, people say to me all the time, I don't know that I can pray all night. You ever hear anybody say that? I don't think I can pray all night. Uh, okay, yes, you can. I can, I can fix it. All alone in a strange continent, in a foreign country, in a hotel full of East Germans, in a country ruled by a communist military dictatorship, and no contact whatsoever. Trust me, you will pray. And I walked the floor and prayed and cried out to God. And Five o'clock, the air raid siren got off. I got, the water came back on. It had been off all night. It came back on. I got a shower, got dressed, sitting on the end of my bed. <laughs> I don't know what I thought was going to happen. I said, okay, Lord, here I am. And there was a knock at my door. I opened the door, and there was a very nice-looking African man standing there in a suit and tie. He said, he said are you... Rutland, I said, yes, I am. He said, my name is Godfrey Bamfo. He said, I, I've come to get you and take you to Kumasi. <laughs> I wanted to kiss him on the mouth. I, I, I said, why are you here? Who are you? He said, I'm a businessman here in town. I'm connected to the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. He said, they just called me from Kumasi last night and said, there's an American in Accra, city of a couple of million people, we don't know where he is. All we know his name is Rutland. We think he's in the city. See if you can find him. And he said, I asked myself, where are there likely to be whites staying? And I came to this hotel and they said, there's an American in this room number. And I've come to get you and get you up to Kumasi. Here's what happened. The letter that I wrote on the first of July, 
arrived in Kumasi the day that I arrived in Accra, the 3rd of December. The 3rd of December, the letter arrived and Dr. Riverson put it in his coat pocket and took it to a faculty prayer meeting. At the prayer meeting, he pulled the letter out and he said, this American has written, he wants to come and visit Ghana, but it seems like a terrible time to invite an American to come to Ghana. Let's pray about it. They knelt down to pray. And one of the professors, Mac Obrimenu, who later became a professor at Harvard, by the way, and a friend of mine, but I'd never heard of any of these people. You have to understand this is all happening without me knowing it. You do understand what I'm saying, right? Mac Obrimenu had a word of knowledge. As they bowed to pray, he said, the Lord says, there's no use to pray. That man's in the country. He's, in, he's already in Accra. There's no conceivable way anybody could know any of this. And so they made a phone call to Kumasi, to Accra, if you only could understand that in itself was a miracle to get the phone call through. And so they didn't know who to call, but they called this guy who was a member of Full Gospel Businessmen's, Godfrey Bampo. And so he put me on a public transport, a bus up to Kumasi. And I, I went to Dr. Riverson's house at Wesley College. I had places to preach and I was having a good time. Now, hold, pause. I want to take you back to my house. I've saved it for now. There was one other thing that happened in the house and I, I want to have it clear in your minds. When I said to the Lord, okay, I'll, I'll go to Ghana, a picture came before me as clear as I can see you. I saw myself standing in front of a tree, just standing at a tree, and there were hundreds of Africans seated on the ground or on fallen logs or things like this. And standing beside me, there was a man. I saw him as clearly as I could see Pastor Joey standing beside me to interpret. Just that, but like a snapshot, and it was gone. While I was at Dr. Riverson's house at Wesley College, they came and said, there is a meeting at a nearby village called Santazi, and would I come out and speak at this village? I said, fine. So we went out there, and it was supposed to be in the schoolhouse. When we got to the school, it was empty. And I said, oh, nobody came. They said, no, there was too many people. We couldn't get them in the school. So they're down in the cocoa grove at the bottom of the hill. So we went down there and they said, the people have already been here for like three hours. So just, don't wait, just go. They said, step up there to that tree. There was a kind of a concrete thing here in a tree and your interpreter will join you. And I, I stepped up to that tree and a, a small man stepped out of the crowd and came to stand beside me. And we looked at each other and he said, I'm ready to help you. Wow. And it was, it was the man I had seen in my living room. It was as clear as anything. I, I was dumbfounded. It was the very face I saw in my living room. Our friendship was God-ordained. He was my friend in my living room nine months before I met him in person. I knew him, I loved him like you love Jesus, having not seen him. And God knit our hearts together. Everything that has happened, all our work that we had in India, all the work in South America, all the work that we still have in Thailand, all the work that we have in Africa, everything began at the root of that tree. So I, what I want to tell you is, Whatsoever the Lord saith unto thee, do it. It would be a better story if I told you that the minute I heard it, I went and bought the ticket. It took me nine months of agony to work through it. It just seemed so crazy that it took me nine months. My wife has pointed out to me on more than one occasion that that is the gestation period. <laughs> she, said, she said, I'm happy for you to have nine months of pain to bring forth. 
took me nine months to work through to that. But I feel brave, courageous, and bold. I felt terrified and stupid. You know, one of the things I was the most terrified about was coming home and telling everybody that nothing had happened. My pride is ego. I was terrified that I'd have to come home. They said, well, tell us the miracle. I said, no miracle. I stayed in a motel three nights, terrified and frightened of East Germans, and came home. See, God doesn't reveal the end game to you. He just says, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. You can gripe and complain. Simon Peter did. He said, Lord, we have fished all night and taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, we will let down the nets. That's what I said to God for nine months. I said, Lord, if you would send somebody with an invitation, he said, I didn't say respond to the invitation. I said, go to Ghana. So to whatever extent it sounds to you like I was courageous or obedient, I just want to assure you that there has never been a more reluctant, frightened, weak instrument but what it led to, everything, everything since then, everything since then hung on that moment. And that moment, that precise moment, standing at the foot of that tree with that man translating for me, I saw in my living room in a vision or whatever it was, and God brought it to pass. Now, I know it's nearly 7.30, but if you will just stay where you are for just a moment. What about now? So I'm gonna show you a video. I was just back in Ghana a couple of years ago, and I wanna show you a video that I shot at that exact spot. So they're gonna bring the house lights down, and I hope you'll enjoy this. Only the power of God could connect my living room in the United States with a small village outside of Kumasi, Ghana. There in my living room in early 1981, I had what I suppose would be called a vision. And in that vision, I saw myself preaching, standing up to a tree, and around me were hundreds and hundreds of African people. And beside me was a man ready to interpret when I preached. I saw his face as clearly as you can see mine right now. It never dawned on me that I would see that exact face in Santasi. On my first trip to Ghana in 1981, which was a supernatural trip all the way around, and I know many of you have read about it in my book, Launch Out Into the Deep. On that trip, so many wonderful things happened. But finally, they brought me to this village of Santasi to speak to a fellowship. Hundreds of people were supposed to be here. When I got here to this elementary school, it looked just like this. It was empty. And I said, oh, nobody came. They said, no, there's so many people, we couldn't get them in the school. We've gone down to the cocoa grove. So we wound down the side of the hill into the cocoa grove, and I stood at the roots of the tree to preach. And there, at the roots of that tree, God changed my life change the future and the direction of global service forever. And so I came here to the roots of the tree and they said, go ahead and preach. Your interpreter will join you. And I turned and there he stood. There was the man that I had seen in my living room in the United States. And he said, I'm ready to help you when you are ready. And help me he has, and helped thousands of people in West Africa. Samuel Odana, our West African director, look what God has done from this humble beginning. When I first stood by you, I didn't know what to expect, but we thank God for the miracle that out of that time, so much has happened. It is a miracle. It is. 
churches in five countries, a large school, so many things, all the work we did in prisons and in, in police stations and fire stations. It's really a miracle. It is. And now to turn the work over to your son, Daniel, and my son, Travis, and see the work of global servants in West Africa and worldwide go forward in a whole new generation. Thank you for that wonderful day, Sammy. And we thank God. Thank you for allowing me to be part of that's, that's the actual moment right there. Somebody took the picture, and it's the most treasured picture in my, in my entire portfolio. And here at Beaufort Church of God tonight, that same man is right here. I would like you, if you will wait just a moment, I'd like Sammy to just share a word with you, whatever he has, and then we'll pray. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for your spirit of adventure and willingness to hear this story. Here's Sammy O'Donnell. Please sit. Because we have sat for a long time, I want to take the part where I met him. The principal, he talked about Braille Reversing. And I belong to a group, a youth group called Scripture Union. It started from England. And I was working for that group in Kumasi. So I often went to the principal to ask for permission to use a school auditorium for conferences. So one day I went out. And when I got back, my wife told me he had been in the house looking for me. But I remember I hadn't sent any letter applying for the use of the college. So in the evening, he came back. Then he told me about Mark and the letter he had received. Now, I had a phone in my house. It had broken down for more than one year. And I had been chasing the company to repair it. And that week, the phone was repaired. So when reversing came, asked him for help to talk to somebody in Accra. We checked on the phone, and the dialing tone was on. So it was that phone he used to talk to the man to go and look for Mark. I didn't hear anything from him again till about a week later. Then he came. Mark was in his car. When I saw him, my mind went to the book of Acts, chapter 8, Philip, the evangelist, who will be preaching and then God will tell him, go here and he will leave and then go. So I saw Mark like one of the characters in the book of Acts. And then Riverson said, anywhere you are going to preach, you can visit, uh, pick him and then go with him. So we went to Santa as one of the places. And then all that happened. But I thank God that today, I have also had the opportunity to visit him in his country. God bless you. So would you like the experience, as many, many people in Ghana have, of hearing uh, the word translated from, you'll hear it in English, and then in three. Would you like that? So Sammy, come back and we'll do it as we have done. We always say, this is biblical. He makes up the two, one new man. <laughs> oh, fine. Thank you very much. All right. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you that we can trust you. No matter how frightening the adventure seems. You are the author and finisher of our faith. If you call us to it, you will also provide. I thank you, God, 
that you're a good God. You may not be safe, but you're always good. Now God bless this precious church. Every person here, this wonderful pastor, Lord, I pray that you will constantly call all of them up higher, out further, into the deep. Amen. 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 Can you stand with me tonight? I am going to steal this moment for some really selfish reasons. The um, Dr. Rutland, I know that I uh, stay with me because I need to steal you while I'm stealing your moment. I'm going to uh, steal a prayer from them. Um, I don't know exactly what God's doing through me and this church. I do know that when I launched into my ministry, it was that story. And so it, it's really um, a big moment for me to be at an, another crossroads and, and hear this same story. But I'm going to Ukraine next week. We're kind of used to that around here now. Uh, we're trying to open up another ministry center. I'll be in Romania. We're planting a church in northern Romania. We have an orphanage in Brushton. I was contacted two days ago about a ministry that they want me to be a part of in DR Congo. And another opportunity in Zambia and Kenya and Tanzania. And we have the churches that we've planted just this last month in the Dominican and the students that we just sent to Puerto Rico and our ministry in Guatemala and was contacted about our connections in South America. All of this has happened in, I don't know, three years, five years we started this. We went from nothing to maybe by the end of this year, maybe half a million dollars that we'll give away to World Missions Projects. And so, let's just launch out into the deep and let's let down our nets and let's follow in these, these courageous footsteps. And so, if you don't mind, I want you to stretch your hands this way, Mia, if you'll join me. And I, I don't know what all of this means, but there's any part of that that can rest on us we would we would like to have that relationship with God and Heavenly Father we lift him up to you we pray oh God that you the boldness of the line of the tribe of Judah and Lord your your love would flow through to each and from them both and separately to people all over the world. Wherever you say, wherever you lead, Lord, that they will hear your voice and that they will obey and that you will anoint and bless their every effort. We, we bless them, oh God. We bless them as adventurers of the next generation. Bless them, use them, oh God. We believe you for Amen. Anybody need a little of that in your own life? Just throw your hands up. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, fourfold on everybody here. I pray, God, that you would just 
capture their hearts with imagination. Church, take your time. I, I know we, we may feel in a hurry right now, but there's too many hearts being broken right now. I see it all over the church. There is, there's a call. You know, we used to talk about this. Who feels called? And I sense a, a calling. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, no weapon formed against them will prosper. Go before them as a cloud by day and a fire by night. I ask you, Heavenly Father, that you would provide all their needs according to your riches and glory. I pray, God, that courage and faith would be the characteristics of our calling, not caution and, and fear, but rather, Heavenly Father, this, this reckless abandon, this, this dangerous adventure, this obedience that we yield. And Jesus, I'm sorry. I, I, I ask you to forgive me of my sins, Lord. I, I, I travel and I do all of these things and I take resources and I withhold. I, I complain on these trips about how I don't speak the language and yet they have to talk me into preaching and great things happen when I do that. And I oftentimes just, just go and supply and do one or two things and then I come home quickly. But God, I sense in my heart that there's more that you want from me and I've held it back. And I ask you, God, to forgive me. I ask you, Lord, I've... I've I've held back from so many areas in my life because of, of the jaded sense of what it might take from my calendar or from my future. And I bind that spirit of disobedience in me in the name of Jesus. Here am I. Send me. Use my life, Heavenly Father. And ignite me with the power of the Holy Spirit that it's not by might nor by power but by your Spirit, Heavenly Father. Create in me, Lord, the willing heart to say yes. And we yield all of this into your hands. In Jesus' precious and mighty name, and all God's people said aloud victorious. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. I love you. Can't wait to see you on Sunday.